Though he did take care of my Bubba Gump money. He got me invested in some kind of fruit company. And so then I got a call from him saying, we don't have to worry about money no more. And I said, that's good. One less thing. Howdy, theologian. Howdy. <laughs> howdy. Howdy. I'm still getting used to that. What, the word howdy? No, I think calling you a theologian. Just oh, kidding. Oh, <laughs> dang. Um, you're a big Forrest Gump fan, aren't you? When I am asked, what is your favorite movie? It is always my answer. You, is it because it's true or easy? Um. It, a little bit easy and safe, right? Yeah. But it also, like, anytime it's on, I it's just love down. it. I just love it. Do you it cry during it? Do you cry every time you watch it? Um, I kind of always tear up a little when he tears up at the end when he's, like, talking to Jenny's grave. Oh, my gosh. I know. When he places he their talks, son's letter and he does it. I know. I can't. And he's like, he's so smart. Oh, so it's, good. It is a great movie. I know. And I so love it. I love this quote as an example of what we're talking about today. Grace? Yeah, but a very specific way of understanding and receiving grace. Bum, bum, bum. Wish I had some apple stock. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Golly. Wouldn't it be nice to not have to worry about something? <laughs> Just one less worry. <laughs> Just one less worry. <laughs> I could use one less worry these days. It's a good, uh, it's, it's going to be a good episode because grace is as we talked about in the last episode is really the, the beginning piece for us as we understand our relationship to God and restoring the relationships. Uh, grace is at the heart of it all. And so here we are talking about grace and we're going to need several episodes to do it because we are Wesleyan. That's correct. We are Wesleyan United in our Methodist. approach, yes. in our approach to theology. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a big Wesley fan. John Wesley, yeah, me too. And I, Charles. I like Charles, but really I like their mom. She was kind of badass. You know? Yeah. Yeah. She, she was, was very good. intense. So great. She was very intense. Yeah. I would not have appreciated that environment growing up. Susanna Wesley like was very strict, right? Like she like had them reading bef I think it's a I think it might be a little bit of a myth, but the myth is that she had them reading before they could walk. Yeah, or by the time they could walk. But That's she a, taught her girls, too. Yeah, she no, that. she was equity. She like, believed yeah. that both boys and girls should learn to read and that they should mm -hmm. practice their faith. And she had them, she had them, like, lined up and in shape. So It would be an intense home to grow up in. Yeah, but, yeah, that's, no, that's... Do you think they had a lot of fun? Um... I don't I Did don't anyone know. have fun back then? I don't know. I think like you were so desperate to just survive. <laughs> <laughs> there was no fun was space like, for fun. Fun was like getting an orange S such for Christmas, a you know? I mean, that was like a treat. Thanks, Laura <laughs> Ingalls Wilder. <laughs> oh, it's not coal. It's an orange. Exactly. Like, I do try to remind my kids of that. You know, like back in the day, kids would love getting fruit for Christmas. <laughs> Sorry we didn't get your switch game this year here's <laughs> yeah. a bag of tangerines <laughs> so i think fun to fight off scurvy too probably well and it was like <laughs> such I a like treat medicine. to get because it didn't grow in all the northern places it was For, like a yeah a delicacy yeah so all the um yeah i mean there's why is... banana republics exist wait what banana republics the I mean, store no <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I actually read something uh, the other day, and we're off topic, but this will, I don't know how we'll connect it, but I, I feel like I need to say it now. Did you know, like, bananas are, there's, like, a real concern that bananas could go extinct? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, there's, like, a virus. There's this race against time to try to, like, save the bananas. Oh my gosh. That's as much as I can offer at this point without <laughs> having the article in front of me. But, uh, and where did you read this article on the uh, onion? 
Could have been. Oh, gosh. Could have been. I'll find it out. I'll bring it to the next episode. Okay. More banana talk. Okay. All right. So, yeah, oranges were treats. If oranges were fun, I'm just saying fun was probably relative. So, did they have fun? Probably, but we probably wouldn't have considered it very fun. Yeah. Playing hopscotch or something weird. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well. Anyway, it would have been hard, but you like the Wesleys. Yeah, I mean, they. whatever she did, them, produced yeah. some good theology. Yeah. Which is all about grace for us as Wesleyan. Huge emphasis on grace. Yeah. So let's talk about the word grace real fast. We use it a lot. We do. Cause it, it, and I think it's one of those words that the more you say, the less you actually <laughs> understand what it means. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's... We use it in so many different contexts that it sort of gets, it's like a magnet. It like attracts all these different definitions or circumstances in which we use it. And so it's hard to like actually get to the the heart of the matter because it's in all the songs we sing as Christians and yeah. you know, all the prayers. It's yeah. a big portion of uh, theology as it relates to salvation. And so- it, it- it, the, yeah, the bigger the word is, the more it encompasses, the less we actually feel the impact of it. All right, define it for us. Well, it's a noun, and it's, an, it's used in a lot of ways, even outside of the church, in the vernacular, if you will, mm-hmm. to kind of just mean like favor or um, a pleasing attribute. But for our theological definition of it, it would be God's unmerited favor, love, or help. It's kind of a good generic overarching definition of the word grace. And it comes from Old French from the 12th century. We have this Latin root, gratias, gratia, is that right? Mm-hmm, gratia, sure. which means favor or esteem mm-hmm. um, or gratitude. And that's actually the root word of like gracias in Spanish and grazie in Italian. So it's some it's some sort of connection to expressing gratitude for a favor. Expressing gratitude for like a blessing. And actually I kind of love this too. In music, the word grace is often used to describe like an extra trill or like a extraneous kind of line of music that isn't necessary to the core um, the core like melody. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of like this idea of it's like this extra blessing, this extra like treat, this kind of unexpected benefit. Because a I actually, gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's where the word grace comes from. Um, I, I personally have a working definition that I use when I talk to someone about grace. Okay. And I think that's important because for me, it helps to take it away from this, you know, okay, blah, blah, blah. God's grace exists. Isn't blah, that blah. wonderful? Uh, you know, God's this just grace. because think, okay, you said the word gift. And mm-hmm. I think that's really important because when we think of a gift, it's often we don't pay for it. We don't earn it. Right. A gift is truly this like just blessing, this benefit, this like thing that we receive from someone else from like the right. goodwill of someone else but without it's any expectation in return typically, right yeah right. typically uh, but there's also then how easy it is for us to become um complacent with the gift right to like just take a gift for granted so it's easy i think in many ways for us to take this idea of grace yeah. in the church for granted and that's why when I talk about grace, I use this working definition where I talk about it as the unmerited, unearned, and undeserved, because all those mean the same thing. But I feel like it's really important to be reminded that we do not earn or deserve or merit by any means of our own this presence, this gift. And it's the loving action of God in our lives and in the world. So un merited, unearned, undeserved, loving action of God in our lives and in the world. That's my working definition of grace. What do you think? I like it. I think it's specific specific enough to make sense, broad enough to really challenge us to 
to like be practical about it. So we have to work to like see it in the world. We can't just take it for granted. Yeah. Otherwise it becomes yeah, yeah. nebulous. And um, I, I'm getting stuck and we can work this out at another, on another pod, but I am getting stuck on the notion of unmerited and I'm maybe say more about that when we talk about parenthood, but the, the idea that God doesn't owe us anything, um, is really challenging for me. Okay. And it's, and it's, why? I, because I, I attach it to parenthood and I attach it to grace being this, this, um, feeling specifically prevenient grace, which we'll talk about in a sec, this idea that, um, you know, I love, I love my boys before they're even aware of it. Um, but I'm not sure that they're undeserving of my love, right? Because of just their existence sort of may deserve a response from me as a co-creator. So it's almost like you're saying I helped make them and therefore I actually do owe them something. Love. Yeah. Love and care. Yeah. In return. Um, so I, I get, I get, okay, okay, okay. I get that. By their sheer existence. Right. right. Their existence merits my love. But I, I guess what I think is really important in talking about grace mm -hmm. and that I just think we need to be careful with removing, with kind of making it seem like we earn somehow. No doubt. And like we no do things to deserve God's loving action in our no, lives. I agree. And we, you know, by our choices and behavior, we like get the gold star of God's love. I totally agree. And that's why I think the working definition for me, the unearned bit is probably... The one I gravitate most towards, uh -huh. um, because I do think by existing, we are existing within God's own creation. Yeah. Like God made us. He better take care of us. Doesn't, don't, right. Yeah. Oh, interesting. The, I mean, do, don't we owe the things we create our love and our attention? I don't know. Do we create them for ourselves or for their own sake? I guess it depends on what we're creating, right? I guess so. Um, ah, and this is goes so complicated, <laughs> you know? What? Can we just go back to the definition, well, God's well, unmerited favor, love, or help, and call it good, right? Because I think that we, it plays out, and this is why I like the word, I lean into the word loving action of God. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like unmerited favor, love, or help, like what is, I mean, help kind of gets at it, but there has to be an effect of it. We have to... Mm -hmm. Grace isn't just like this nebulous. An idea or feeling. Exactly. It has a response. Exactly. It spurs a it, response. It right? makes an impact. It changes things in our lives and in the world. And so there's like this active component mm -hmm. to it. It's not just a passive thing that's floating there kind of somehow right. for us. It's, it, it changes things. Yeah. It has an impact. For sure. And grace is a theological, um, you know, it's a huge foundational piece to our constructive theology, right? The notion that we're working to, to say something true about who God is. Uh, scripture talks about grace a lot, but is all over the place as scripture tends to be. And so throughout history, theologians have really wrestled with how to best explain define grace. Yeah. I mean, and I think this is really important before we get into what the theologians say is that we actually see grace throughout scripture, even if it doesn't always appear the way we expect it to. And by that, I mean, I think a lot of Christian for a lot of Christians, it's easy to look at the Hebrew Bible, the old Testament and say, well, that's a God of 
wrath or, or anger. anger judgment right there's right. no grace there right and then they look at the new testament and like but this is where god's grace shows up in jesus yeah. essentially but i but my sermon on sunday right I, I we used a text from exodus where there's essentially a recovenanting is that a word that's not a word but the mm -hmm. sort of repairing of a covenant that in and of itself is an act of grace well and throughout the hebrew scripture god is constantly stepping in and coming to, back yeah. to help save humanity in a variety of ways, even from the beginning. Right. I mean, the story of Adam and Eve eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and their eyes are open. And so they see that they're naked. Right. And the first thing they do to try to cover this embarrassment, vulnerability, shame, whatever you want to say, is to sew themselves close of fig leaves, which someone once told me were very itchy. So I can only imagine having those as your only covering and God is so mad, right? That this happened and they have this huge confrontation. And yet the first thing God does is sew them clothes with animal skins. And so there's kind of this sense of even in this, yeah, even in this confrontation and like kind of down, oh, yeah. this, this kind of breaking of how oh, creation oh. was, originally yeah. set up there is grace and there is well, just the fact that they didn't die yeah right i mean like don't eat of this tree or you will die or you'll die okay you're not gonna die but it's gonna be <laughs> really bad all right like you see god sort of really desiring to maintain a relationship with creation yeah yeah and i think that's a that in and of itself is an act of grace that we see yeah. throughout scripture, not just reserved for the death and resurrection of Christ. Yeah. Which is also often the lens in which Christians understand grace. Right. But God has always been gracious and we have evidence of that throughout scripture. Throughout scripture. And I, I don't know, I'm, I'm keep going back to like, does God owe us grace because God created us or is it more that God offers grace because that's who God is. Uh, maybe I'm uh, towards maybe creation. I'm, maybe I'm I'm just Job, you know, like <laughs> I demand an answer, right? Like yeah. there's something that we God God is in this covenantal relationship, right? So when God is absent or feels absent, I think it's fair for us to say, "Where are you?" Like we see that in we scripture a lot. You should yeah. show up. We Where expect are you? You, you to expect show to show up. We've done, we've been faithful. Yeah. We've right. Where are you? Yeah. And we may not always like the response like Job. Um, but I think it's a very natural thing to be like, well, yes, you should love us. We, we, we are your creation. Right? Yeah. Um, that isn't to say that, you know, we have a way to earn or, or I don't know, does, live a life that's deserving of more of God's love, because I don't think that there's anything we can do or anything uh, we have done that changes the amount of love that God has for us. Right. That's always there. It's that's just always there. our it's capacity constant. to receive it yeah. and to recognize it. It's more of a, doesn't God, isn't God's like, naturally going to love us because we are in existence. But I feel like Nat God is going to naturally love us because of who God is. Sure. Because of who the creator is. Right. Because the creator loves what the creator right. creates. Right. The very act of creation <laughs> is an act of love. Yeah, I, okay. We'll get to Pelagius. <laughs> okay. Uh, but first we're with Augustine. Um, this idea of unmerited favor, that's really the foundation, as we saw in the definition. Um, but then, yes, please tell us about Pelagius. So you have Augustine, unmerited favor, Pelagius says. Yeah, Pelagius is a, a monk in England, actually, a British monk. And he was really upset by Augustine's view of um, kind of God's will being totally like to overcome totally our will and felt like um, Augustine was denying the free will that humans have to choose 
goodness to choose to respond to God's grace. And so Pelagius um, argued with Augustine uh, like big time. And it was this like huge controversy and ultimately lost the powers that be. Yeah. (laughs) Determined that uh, Pelagius's stance was heresy. And Mm -hmm. that led to a lot. I mean, that led kind of towards one arm of um, the interpretation of, you know, grace and how grace shows up yep. and sin kind of are related to one another, right? But the reality is, is that Pelagius and Pelagianism is actually always maintained a foothold in theological development, even from this point. And so in some ways or another, like, Pelagius still influenced a lot of the theology that we have, even in Protestantism, like Catholic and Protestantism. Now, maybe not, they won't, wouldn't ever claim that in like classical theology and because he was labeled a heretic, because he was labeled as a heretic. And because what he said is so threatening to this concept of original sin, but he talks about, he talks about how the very act of creation is one of grace. And so he has this notion that he calls original grace, which is that God, God gives God's grace freely and gave God's grace to creation. And so we start from, we are like exist out of grace and therefore we have this free will that allows us to choose grace. So Pelagius is labeled a heretic and, and, the that notion of grace is sort of squashed for a long time, but begins to sort of peak has, back up. It has oh, its it does, it can't Thomas get rid of it. Aquinas yeah. is sort of struggling with this, yeah. as he writes about habitual grace, right? The predisposition that we have for the mm-hmm. soul to align itself to God, and then there is the notion of actual grace, which is the more tactile, um, specific. Um, movement of God's grace in our life. Then Luther sort of paints really broadly with this notion of great, everything that is good is because of God's grace. Salvation in all of its forms is solely by the grace of God, which I don't necessarily disagree with. But then he also God, emphasized grace by alone. Faith. Right. faith alone. Faith alone. Yep. And grace alone, right? <laughs> Which <laughs> I think I I just think that's a really interesting. How can it how can it be grace alone if also then that, that requires faith? Ah, because faith is uh, is grace. Mm. Then Calvin though is the one who just totally ruins it for all of us, <laughs> because Calvin essentially says that there are people who are saved and people who are. Uh, Damned. Damned. Uh, And that's God's choice. God chooses that. And so the people who are saved receive God's grace and the people who don't, don't receive God's grace. And that's for God to sort of work out, not for us. Right. And there's nothing we can do about it. Nothing we can do about it. The die has been cast. Yeah. And we either receive God's grace or we don't. The notion of predestination. Mm Mm-hmm. And then Wesley, where we find our great love of, of the theological con- concept of grace, Wesley understood grace um, in sort of this <laughs> heretical way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, kind of. <laughs> right? Because it goes back to Pelagius, right? Yeah. Pelagius influenced, inv- yeah. Inv- influences Armenians, and the Armenians then influence Wesley. And Wesley, I think, starts with this this idea that grace is inherently complex, that the love God has for us isn't maybe complex, but the way it shows up in our lives, how we experience it, how we respond to it is it's far dynamic. more co- dynamic. It's dynamic. Uh, dynamic. That's yeah. a good word. Dynamic. It's not like a static switch. It's not a switch that you flip or, you know, turn on and off. It's not a static, you know, one and done kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah, that we are constantly receiving God's grace and constantly then invited to participate it, in it in different ways and respond to it right. in different ways. Um, and 
I think, you know, it's funny because Wesley would say that, you know, humanity is fallen and cannot do anything apart from God's grace. So it's by God's grace that we can even respond Mm -hmm. to God's grace. Um, But, you know, in some ways, it's kind of like Lieutenant Dan. (laughs) He he takes for his money and invests it before he even knows it or is aware of it. And because of that, you know, Forrest is like, oh, my gosh, like, I don't have to worry about this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so there is like this active then impact in our lives right. that allows us then to do other things and to respond to it. Right. Like force mm-hmm. doesn't have to worry about money so he can do a lot of different stuff. Right. Um, and he, he's freed up. He, he's freed up. Yeah. To go and live so, the best version of himself. Right. To flourish. Mowing that lawn. <laughs> so, so I just think it, it, when we think of, you know, grace, Wesley would say like, okay, yes, we're the worst, but only by God's grace can we even turn and choose God. But that doesn't have to come with a consciousness of our own. And that's where we get to provenient grace. Right. Yeah. So Wesley talks about grace in, in three distinct ways, provenient grace, justifying grace and sanctifying grace. But it's that provenient grace or the idea that um, God's grace is active, present, ongoing in our life before we're even aware of it. Yeah, because provenient as an adjective means the coming or going before a preceding, uh, yes, previous. Um, and it comes from, it's used as provenient grace in about the 1650s for the first time. And it comes from the Latin words that mean before and to come. So something that goes before or comes before. And so provenient being the adjective that modifies the word grace, provenient grace is a grace that precedes and goes before our own awareness of God, our own awareness of our need for grace, our own awareness of anything to do with the divine love that created us in the first place. So we're going to define provenient grace as the grace that precedes our awareness of God. Yeah. Yeah. Provenient grace. The grace, I always think of it as the grace that goes before. Which has actual implications for our work together as a church, right? It's, it, it affects how we understand the sacraments. It affects how we welcome people into the life of the church. Uh, it affects how we, how we relate to other people mm-hmm. who are not of our faith tradition or who are Correct. not members of our church or who are totally separated. Like it, it impacts a lot of how we even believe then that we are called to respond. Yeah. Uh, it's the best, uh, the best example I, I have. Well, I have two. Um, one I've already talked about parenting, uh, parenting, which we'll go back to in a second. Really but. just creating your kids though. <laughs> Them existing. That's what you mean. Well, hold on. <laughs> So when I baptize a baby though, right? Yeah. Um, it's great honor and I love it. It's one of the favorite, my favorite things to do as a pastor. It's um, a promise that we make uh, to the child to raise a child up in the faith. But I also add this line in there um, when I'm walking the, the baby out to the congregation and everyone's like very pleased and happy to see the baby. And, um, I had this line that, the, the you know, part of our responsibility as a church is to ensure that this child always knows that they have a place. They have a place of belonging where they can um, experience God's love and that there's nothing that that child can do to uh, to change that equation, that God's love for them will always be um, constant and present in their life before they're even aware of it. The, the, the awareness piece is later. But provenient grace is that thing that is constantly at work in our life. And we really become aware of it personally when we look back into our life, right? It's sort of having um, hindsight Mm -hmm. is really the best way to understand God's provenient grace in our life because um, God's constantly at work in our life without our awareness, I would argue. Yeah. 
right? Yeah, I mean, yes, I believe that. So Provenient Grace is this beautiful uh, preamble, I think, to what it means to be United Methodist because we make that assumption that, you know, the Provenient Grace is available to all people. That is not only available, but is active and ongoing Present. in every yeah. single human being's life. Yes, and in creation. And all of creation. I love it. Yeah, I think that's really, I think it, it is really unique and beautiful for us to explain it that way. You know, and I, and I say it's unique because, like, you mentioned infant baptism. I mean, that's one of our root reasons for doing, for, for baptizing infants, because we believe that baptism is a means of grace, is a means of um, experiencing God's grace in this ritual moment. Right. And that because it doesn't require anything of the baptized person, because it's all God's grace that's at work, right? right. That's the, the power, the presence, the active work of mm. baptism is God's grace. And it doesn't demand awareness or response from the person who is being baptized. Mm -hmm. Now, that means that not only can we baptize infants, but we can baptize people who, for whatever reason, would never be able to mentally comprehend mm -hmm. or even come close to comprehending what happens, right? So it really is this expansive way of understanding God's grace and acknowledging it and claiming it. Um, not claiming it, again, as something we do, but something that God's, God's already done. Yeah, and so and as, theologically, we claim this. Like right. we make this claim about God's grace for us um, without us needing to do anything. Now there is also though, and this is why we baptize. I mean, we don't just like baptize babies by themselves. <laughs> we baptize them because they are brought forward yeah. by their families, right. their loved ones, those who care for them. And we baptize people in the context of the Christian community, in the context of the church. And that means like you have said, when you walk the baby out, now it's like all of our, right. We've all then experienced this moment of grace and borne witness to God's provenient grace in this person's life who doesn't understand it yet. And it's our job then as the Christian community to help them learn and grow in grace. And I love that concept growing grace. And I think as we like lead to the next kind of means of grace, the next ways of understanding grace, this idea of growing in grace is really important because Again, it means it's not one and done. It's not like we have it and that's it, period. Or it's not a switch that you flip on and off. Yeah, We have the ability to grow in God's grace, but it doesn't mean that God's grace grows for us because that is eternal and open and already abundant, already more than we could ever imagine. Totally. Right. And so God's grace is there for us, but our ability to recognize it, to understand it, to receive it yeah. and to be transformed by it. That's how we grow in grace. Yeah. And that leads to the other ways that we experience grace. Like you've mentioned justifying and sanctifying, which, which you can kind of see what, where Pelagius was going, uh, right? Yeah. This idea that, um, just by simply existing, by being a part of creation, if creation is an act of God's grace, if it wasn't, if God was not mandated to create, right? If God wasn't forced to create, if God creates out of God's own desire to be the creator, then the simple act of existence is that moment of grace, right? Yeah. So, and I should, gift of free will right? is a, is an act of grace. Exactly. Because, a coercive God who doesn't offer free will, um, you know, who, who tries to control is not uh, a loving God. Yeah. Because there's no freedom. Right. I mean, love. Love requires freedom. Yeah. 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 And, and the ability to be disappointed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So God but, can be disappointed. Right. Don't we think? Uh, yeah. I mean, sure. I think that's all throughout scripture. <laughs> God's disappointed. disappointed. Jesus is constantly disappointed by the disciples, by, you know, just the crowd. Opening up those stockings every Christmas and never getting an orange, you know, just how much disappointment just would have existed. Just a shriveled apple. <laughs> no, but I do want to talk about this real fast because I think scripture 
gives us so many powerful examples of provenient grace. When I think about Jesus, because Jesus is so disappointed in the disciples in so many ways. And yet over and over and over again yeah. in the gospels, we are also told that Jesus has compassion. He has compassion for the crowds because they're like sheep without a shepherd. He has compassion for those who are trying to figure this out. I mean, it, it just, it, we're reminded constantly that Jesus has compassion for the people and he doesn't have it because they deserve it. He has right. it because they're like lost and they didn't do anything to earn his love and his regard and his work, you know, for yes. them. He even says I, he has compassion for the crowd when they're hungry. And so that's why he wants to feed them because so he like feeds them out of his compassion, not out of their Danny. earning of yeah. food or anything yeah. like that. Um, well, and it all, it speaks to how God then is active in our life to lead us right into a moment of clarity or, or unity with, with God, that, that God is right. It's the compassion of Jesus that leads individuals uh, and communities to understand that he is the Messiah. Yeah. It's what Paul says in Romans and yeah. Romans two. Yeah. Right. I think we have that slide. Romans two. I'll read it. There it is. Romans 2, or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, right? God's kindness, God's grace is leading us to a moment of awareness. Yeah. And and that is really the heart of prevenient grace, that God is active in our life, drawing us towards God, not active without purpose, there's yeah. purpose yeah. in God's provenient grace. And that is the, but it's not forcing. Us. No, it's no, not no. like leading like no. a dog on a leash or a puppet no, no, on no. a string. Yeah. Inviting us. Yes. Yeah. An ongoing invitation. Yeah, Creating space for us, creating space for us yeah. to, to come to yeah. that awareness. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, and I like the, the story I always think also from scripture is the story of the prodigal son because Jesus tells that story and there's that one line. Um, oh, let me find it. There's a one line where the son has like squandered everything and he finally decides yeah, he's, he's going to come back and apologize eating from pig troughs. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so he's like, fine, fine. I'll go and like beg my father's forgiveness right. essentially. But the line says while he was still far off walking home, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and ran and put his arms around him and yep. kissed him. And so he couldn't even apologize first, right? Like he was still far off and his father ran to him and right. hugged him and loved him. It wasn't him. an apology. And then his father right. turns to him and says, you right. are forgiven right. before he even has the ability right. to respond. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just, when I think of provenient grace, that is a really powerful like image that. for me. Um, that, yeah, reminds me that there's always space. God is always making space, always issuing an invitation, always, you know, seeing me even when I'm far off. That's right. And then we have the ability to respond yeah. to it. Yeah. And we'll talk about that next week. Yeah. Or next episode. Sounds good. I'm excited. Yeah. Grace. By God's grace. Here we go. <laughs> All right. See y'all soon. I'm Reverend Mitchell Boone. And I'm Reverend Elizabeth Mosley, and thanks for listening to Howdy Theologian, a podcast for all who want to better understand the words we use and how they fit into a progressive theological context in today's world. We're pastors at First United Methodist Church of Dallas, and you can find us worshiping in person or online on Sunday mornings. Follow our church on socials for more awesome content, and make sure to subscribe and share with your friends.